Welcome into the Ots and Audibles podcast here on a beautiful Friday morning. Jared and I have been talking. The weather has really changed here in Eugene over the last 48 hours in a very good way. Probably the best days of the year from a weather perspective. So the two of us are recording here on a Friday morning, uh, a day following the first day of spring football practice. And Jared, I must say, I was excited to get out there yesterday. The weather was beautiful. It was fun seeing 28 new players. Um, mm -hmm. Just great to have spring football back. I know it's like a flash in the pan. We're going to have two days and then a break, and then we'll come back in April. But it's just fun to have something like kind of semi-concrete to watch and then now talk about on the podcast. Yeah, we're going to get basically that same feeling all over again in two weeks when <laughs> we get new rosters and, and more than 28 newcomers show up. Um, Hopefully the weather stays as nice, a bit chilly, but I think it should get better uh, as the weeks progress. But yeah, definitely nice to be back out there on the fields and get to watch some football, even though it's you know not real football when we're out there. Yeah, it's not real football. It's not, and that's okay. They were in. We should note spiders mm -hmm. yesterday, which is uh, the precursor to shells, which is the precursor to full pads. So like this is basically a two hand touch equivalent in terms of what they're wearing. I mean, they're wearing the the most limited amount of pads possible. They are not full contact or even close to it. I don't even think they're thud based upon what Dan had to say. So no, 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 I mean, no. this is this is two hand touch football basically. Don't run into anybody. Don't hurt anybody. There are a couple extra guys in red um, who are probably coming back from injuries. But you know, it certainly wasn't a full practice of, of full contact. And again, we don't watch enough to take a ton from it. But what we were able to gather was who is on the roster, who's not, um, and we've got some explanations. So we're just going to run through. All of this. So mm -hmm. I wanted to start with the who is here crowd. So um, Oregon was able to bring in, I think it's pretty impressive, 28 new players um, on the roster were, were there um, to start spring yesterday. I just want to run through uh, all of the players we know who are here. And then we've got some explanations and we have some kind of non-explanations, to be honest, um, for what's going on with the rest of that crowd. But to start, um, let's start with the portal guys because it's a little shorter list. Um, both quarterbacks, Dante Moore and Dylan Gabriel, very much here. Fun watching those guys warm up and throw. Running back Jay Harris was here. Offensive lineman Matthew Bedford, defensive lineman Jamari Caldwell, cornerback Cam Alexander, safety Kobe Savage, and place kicker Atticus Sappington, all present, accounted for. We saw them with our own two eyes. We can confirm that. That leaves a trio of probably – two of the most highly anticipated transfer players, wide receiver Evan Stewart, and then corner Jabbar Muhammad and nickel Brandon Johnson, who are not here. Um, Dan, very little comment when asked about them. I will take accountability for asking first names for players who are transfer commitments who probably haven't signed any paperwork, so theoretically he can't talk about them. So bad on me. But regardless, uh, basically this is what he had to say. Uh, Certainly, there's going to be some guys that will be joining us that we can visit about when they get here. So um, the majority of the transfer guys are here, Jared. Still mm -hmm. three players we're waiting on. Um, I don't know for certain if all three will be here when they reconvene in April. Um, but based upon what Dan said, it certainly seems like at least a couple of them will be. I don't know if you've heard behind the scenes or if you have any sense of who's coming when. I don't have much more to add. Um, I think I'd be surprised if all of them weren't here. Um, I think it just could kind of depend on, uh, you know, getting school credits transferred over. Oregon is always, you know, tough in this situation because of the quarter system. It's just different than every other school in the country, basically. But, um, you know, I'd be surprised if they all weren't here. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal if they aren't, um, depending sure. on who it is. But, you know, Dan has been very vocal about getting guys on campus early, um, as early as possible, basically. And I think that um, it may not seem like much from a spring practice perspective where, you know, the guys on campus now are only getting two ahead of the guys who are coming in, in uh, the later spring category. But um, you know, a lot of these guys have been here for months and have been getting through. Since January. Yeah, walkthroughs, learning the playbooks. Like, yeah, they're not on the field. And, yeah, they're not, you know, playing two in touch and, you know, really building a rapport out there on the field. But – Behind the scenes, they can still work out together. They can still go play catch together. They can still go over drills and do all these other things. So with how adamant Dan has been the last 
whatever, two and a half years of covering him, like about getting guys on campus. I'd be surprised if that wasn't their MO to get everybody they can on campus as early as they can. But, you know, we're, we're going to find out um, just eventually. It's just going to be two more weeks. But, um, yeah, three guys who are incredibly important. But, uh, again, 28 total transfers – excuse me, 28 total people who are on campus early. Pretty damn good out of a class of, you know, 39 or 38 or however many it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, when you include prep plus portal, it is 38 newcomers. And again, mm-hmm. 28 of them are on campus. We should also note Gatlin Bear is amongst that list. So really it's 37 because Gatlin, as we know, is taking a mission. Um, right. So let's really quickly run through the two freshmen who were here and weren't here. I'm going to read this as fast as possible because um, people probably don't like listening to lists on a podcast. But if you haven't seen it, I figured we just run through it here. Uh, 20 members of Oregon's 24 signing class. We're on campus, 19 true freshmen, one junior college player. Those players are Luke Moga, wide receivers Dylan Grisham, Jeremiah McClellan, Ryan Pelham, Jack Ressler, tight ends A.J. Pugliano, Roger Saliapaga, offensive lineman Jaquan McRoy, defensive lineman Aiden Breland, Tione Gray, Jericho Johnson, and Xavier Sims. Outside linebackers Elijah Rushing and Jackson Jones. Inside linebackers Kamar Mathudi, Braden Platt, defensive backs, Dakota Fields, Aaron Flowers, Sione Lalea, and Kingston Lopa. So that's a lot of names, um, but mm-hmm. it does give you a sense, again, if you weren't out of practice, who's here. And Jared, are the actual spring rosters on Go Ducks at this point? I haven't even looked. I know we posted. Uh, I don't know. You we got an email out. saying that they'd be that they'd be up uh, later yesterday afternoon. So I'll give it a good look here. But I – uh, uh, it might be. Yep, they're here now. So for those who would like to see this uh, in real life and not listen to it on a podcast, <laughs> you can go on GoDucks.com and look at the 2024 Oregon roster. Um, all updated, uh, very little positional changes, a couple of few number changes, but uh, includes everybody who's uh, enrolled early and is in practice right now. And just to, to wrap up the who's here, who's not category here, the seven true freshmen who have not enrolled. Obviously, Gatlin Bear is in a different category because he's not going to enroll, but I'll just mention him again. Corner Ife Obadegwu, uh, offensive lineman Fox Crater, uh, Devin Brooks and Trent Ferguson, running back Dewan Riggs, and inside linebacker Dylan Williams. Um, Dan once again was asked, hey, are any of those guys going to be here? And he was like, yeah, but I'm not going to give you any details on who those guys are. Um, I think from what we've heard, though, it's possible two or three of these guys make it up. It's possible more than that. Um, I would be very curious to see exactly what this list looks like when we get to early April. Um, okay, did you have anything else to add on, on this part, Jared? Uh, just with the guys enrolling early? No. I mean, they enrolled <laughs> early. Like, <laughs> there's, there's not much else to say here. Okay. Well, then I wanted to move on to the other kind of the last note from a roster perspective, which is two players that were on last year's team are no longer on this year's roster. And obviously Mm -hmm. there's a ton of players from last year's team who are on this year's roster as well, who've announced transfers and entered the NFL draft or graduated. But these are players that did not make any announcements and we just showed up, we're handed a roster and we're like, hey, they're not on it. And those two players are both offensive linemen, Feope Lalalu and Michael Wooten. Um, Feope, we know talking from Dan, uh, to Dan, I should say, is moving into a student coaching role, a student assistant role, very much like what Suava Poti did last year. Um, mm-hmm. good to see that he's still around. I'm sure older, uh, you know, being the older brother of, of Poncho, he's it probably kind of felt like, hey, maybe I'm not going to get much playing time, let's spend some time with family. Um, you know, I that I think is kind of a cool situation, so he's still around the program, just not playing. Wooten, we don't have an explanation for, but given his really tough years from an injury perspective, I, I do wonder if this is like a medical retirement, but that's not any reporting, Jared, um, just because Dan didn't get into that one. But Wooten probably had like a 30% practice participation over his two years here. Um, just that didn't seem like he could ever be yeah. fully able to go. So um, we'll see if we get any information on, on what's going on what the kind of the decision was behind Wooten, but that's, that's where that is. So those two players were not on the roster. And I think that brings us to 89 scholarship players for 2024 based upon what I saw James Crepia 
report and based upon Matt's numbers as well. So mm -hmm. four, four, four players, they still have to move on from or have four player, however you want to frame it. But 89 is a little more palatable than 91, especially to start spring. There's no question about that. Yeah, I was never really worried about the scholarship numbers. Uh, they have, there are guys on this roster who could leave and I think things would be all right. Um, I'll just put it like that. Uh, yeah. For Ope and Wooten, um, certainly hurts the depth. I mean, Ope was like a legitimate backup right tackle mm -hmm. a season ago. Um, there's guys who can fill in that spot. We mentioned Jaquan McCroy. George Silva is another guy. Um, you still have uh, Kavika Rogers, who's primarily like the backup left tackle. But um, if you want to move him right, I guess you theoretically could. So, and then Wooten, yeah, like I think 30% uh, practice rate might uh, honestly be a little generous. Um, he was yeah. very, very, very rarely out there. And um, I hope wherever he goes, he finds a spot that he can be healthy at and play. Um, I think he still has talent. I think he was a, a decent recruit. Like he wasn't anything to laugh about or anything like that. So uh, I ho hopefully it's not a um, like a medical retirement where he just can't go give it anymore. Um, hopefully he can stay back out there on the field. But certainly a, a couple two losses there. But I think Oregon's offensive line depth will be okay. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of concern there. Uh, maybe at the interior positions, but you still return guys like Nishad Strother and things like that. So. I think it'll be okay. Um, I think that's okay, kind of it. There was, I went through the positional changes to see if there was any. Yeah. The only like official one, well, there were two official ones, but the only one that really mattered was Mateo Uyangalale went from defensive end on last year's fall roster to outside linebacker. I think that's just more of a formality than anything. He was essentially an outside linebacker last year. I don't really remember him ever lining up at defensive end. But and the other one was Will Stratton. Will Stratton is mm. now a inside linebacker. Uh, he's taking the Bryce Betcher experience, uh, moving from defensive back to inside linebacker. So, uh, yeah, I think that was it for positional changes. Uh, so it's pretty pretty mundane compared to what it was last season, where there was a lot of positional changes and things. I just think the edge defensive line outside linebacker position thing is the hardest positionally from a roster perspective to designate and they just go back and forth with it. Cause I, yeah. I doubt there's really any positional responsibility changes between what Mateo did last year and this year. And, and we'll have a chance to talk with Tosh Saturday and maybe he'll tell us something completely different, but mm -hmm. I just, I just assume they're trying to group players in certain, like, was there, were there any other defensive ends on the roster? Did they just go straight outside linebacker DL? Which no, is, there's, there's, a little there's some there's a defensive DEs. end. Birch is a defensive end. Um, let me flip over the defensive lineman part. And I think that might be it. <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple I just, D tackles, yeah. but uh, like, yeah, everybody else is just a defensive end or defensive lineman. Um, so shout out Jordan Birch, who's the lone designation. Jersey changes, Jared. I know there were, I think, three we found, right? Yeah, there's a couple. I'm looking at one right now. Dave Ayuli went from 52 to 74. Uh, Treshawn Holden went to five to number one. And Nico Reed went from 25 to nine. I think it was 25. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. But nothing crazy. Um, I kind of like Nico Reed at nine, but now I'm never going to remember who he is when I see him on the field. So thank you. Um, and then Dave Ayuli to 74. Uh, that fits. You know, he's an offensive lineman. Um, 74 will always be Steven Jones in my heart, but uh, mm. Dave Ayuli has a chance to take it away, I guess. But uh, I'm excited to see it. I don't know. It's just an offensive lineman number. Like, there, I have much bigger issues with the true freshmen and what they've decided, but we can leave that for a different day as I yell at a cloud. Well, your point is, is fair there, though, because we've got outside linebackers in like 80s and interior defensive linemen in the 40s, which is just – a little peculiar, it's but wrong, especially when there's a bunch of numbers in the nineties and fifties for defensive players that are open, which they could easily be using. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I, fe I felt the same way. And, and I guess uh, it will be weird seeing somebody else in 74. I hadn't thought about that. Steven Jones has been in that number for like the entirety of my time Eight covering years. this program. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it feels like so um, much like it was weird not having Cam McCormick here 
not having Stephen Jones and Steve Stevens and some of these veterans who've been here for like more than half a decade mm -hmm. kind of will be kind of strange once we get further into this. Uh, kind of a few final things here from an injury perspective, which I think are notable for listeners. Uh, no Whittington was out there uh, on the practice turfs. I thought that was really encouraging. Um, again, it was not a full contact day. Him being out there indicates he is basically able to run around effectively, which is an encouraging thing. Um, Dan said after practice, he's way ahead of schedule. He gave some credit to the training staff for getting him there. But he also said they were going to be conscientious with him throughout spring. So we'll see when they, you know, Saturday's practice will once again be you know, limited padding. Once they get back in April and they get to their full fully padded day, which will probably be like day three or four once they get back, something mm -hmm. like that. It'll be interesting to see if Noah's full go that day. That'll kind of be telling to see where he's at from a football perspective. But I was just really encouraged by the fact that a really important part of the offense who, I don't know, I thought he could miss part or all of spring. It, he was out there day one, at least able to do some things. Yeah, I think we were all kind of worried about uh, what he would look like and when he would come back. Um, I know you talked about it, Eric, on one of our podcasts. That, that the knee injury was pretty significant. And... It looked significant, and his you know timeline seemed like it would uh, you know follow that order and be you know, a potential year long recovery, and which would place him in September because it was yeah. the Colorado game where he got nicked, and he's back day one. And I'll be honest, I didn't really pay too much attention to how he looked. Um, I know that was kind of my responsibilities when I was looking at the punters and the kickers and everything, but there were a lot of things going on. Um, just trying to. I'd, was looking more like Jay Harris and Nico Reed, and but I did see Noah Whittington once or twice, and it looked good. I mean, I don't, I can't tell you. I remember exactly what he looked like pre-injury and what his explosiveness was or anything like that. So it's tough to compare. But I know that he, it was really encouraging that he was out there. He looked exactly the same, um, maybe even a little skinnier, but you know he's still a big dude and. I, you know, I think it's going to be incredibly important that he's 100 percent healthy, right? Or maybe not right now, but. Going into the season, he's got a bunch of more months to ramp up and get healthy and stay uh, stay on track with his recovery schedule. So I think it's incredibly encouraging that he's back. Uh, I didn't honestly expect him to see him at all on day one. It What it certainly clears up is I think he's full go without question for the start of the season, right? If there was any question about that, yeah. I know that's big picture. Like if there's any question about that, mm -hmm. I think that's been settled. Barring some sort of a knock on wood here, some sort of re-aggravation. I think you expect Noah Whittington to be available without question for the start of the season. I thought that was among the things we learned yesterday, probably one of the most exciting parts. Um, the other number six, this one on defense, Julio Florence, not quite as good of news. He was not out there. Um, I think people saw him in street clothes coming into practice. Jan kind of offered similarly a vague answer, which you expect when we're talking about injuries with Dan, even though right. we are months and months from the season. So I don't know how much this impacts pre-scout from an opponent perspective, but um, certainly don't know when we'll see Jaleel, uh, if we'll see him in April or if at all. But Dan, Dan, I think, said it was the same thing as no, where they're just being a little careful with them. So some really positive news with one number six and some, I guess, a little less positive with the other number six. I probably had... Um, similar expectations for them coming into spring in terms of what they'd be able to do. So the fact that one's here, one's not just kind of a mixed bag, 24 hours yeah. in terms of that information, but um, it'll be, that'll be a player certainly we'll be tracking once we come back in, in April. Cause I would imagine if he's not out there Thursday, there's just very little reason to put him out there on Saturday. Yeah. I, I think I'd be surprised if I see Julia Florence this spring. And I think it's, it's always important to get, you know, reps and get guys comfortable with the defense and, you know, get them into football shape while there's, you know, a couple months before the season starts. But Florence to me seems like a guy where if you're pushing it to get him back for spring ball, I don't think it's worth it. I think you'd rather just let him run the course, let him continue to work on his training regimen and then get him back for fall camp where you have a couple weeks before the season starts. Like yeah. it's, it's all, again, it's always nice to have these guys out there in spring ball and learning like, but he's been around here for two years now. He knows the rights. Uh, he was good last season. He just needs to get healthy. And if we see him in spring ball, that'll be great. 
uh, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll all write about it because it'll be a pretty, pretty big development in their spring ball. But, you know, if, if just giving him time off is the biggest thing that's going to help and keep him like on his rehab schedule, then I don't think that there's a need to really play him during the spring. Just kind of last thought on this is who does it benefit if Jaleel's not able to take part? And then, in theory, if Jabbar doesn't show up, let's say Jabbar Muhammad doesn't show up for the second part, that those are mm-hmm. our projected starters at corner, not here for potentially all of spring. We're getting written to hypotheticals. Muhammad might be here day day three when they re- reconvene. Julio Florence, he might pop up midway through April. But I right. think that potentially does provide, you know, some of these guys that are competing. You know, Cam Alexander, who was good to see out there. Um, Aniko Reed, who we mentioned the jersey number change. Uh, Dante Manning, uh, Roderick Pleasant, you know, maybe Dakota Fields. And if he, you know, if he gets here in time, some of these guys maybe have an opportunity to, to work with the ones or move up a level um, and work with the twos if they were going to be with the threes. So I do think, like, big picture, sometimes when you don't have some of your, your top guys throughout a spring, it, it could provide some benefits for some of the younger players to – to position themselves mm-hmm. or for like a Dante Manning, who's I think probably just feels like he's gunning for this. this is his last shot to go for it. Maybe he right. can solidify himself over the next month or so. Yeah. I think it helps Cam and Dante the most. I and mean, they're the most experienced guys in the room. Um, Cam was a multi-year starter at UTSA and Dante has been uh, a fixture in Oregon secondary since, you know, the first Bush administration. So <laughs> he's got, He's got some opportunities here, especially if this theoretical where Muhammad doesn't show up until the summer and then, you know, Florence is not here during the spring. Um, I still feel like there's a lot of ground to make up for those guys regardless. Like, I think I think Muhammad is a lock for a number one starting corner role. But, you know, if Cam and Dante showcase that they can, you know, go toe to toe with Jaleel, I think it's an open competition. I think they have enough depth and talent there at the second cornerback spot where, um, they can have a real competition. And we've been at Oregon spring balls in years past under different head coaches where uh, this is a competition. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. It's really a competition. This is a competition. And it certainly doesn't help Julio Florence that he is hurt and he can't necessarily go out there and compete in this second cornerback spot. But uh, I think that there's a lot of talent there. And I think that even the freshman guys like you mentioned, Eric, uh, like Sione Lalea, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Richard Freshman, like with Roderick Pleasant and Dalen Austin, if he gets healthy, like that'll be a really fun competition to watch. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of names in that room that I'm excited to see. And, but I think it helps Alexander and Dante the most in this hypothetical world. Yeah. And again, it's hypothetical. They, these two might be available immediately when in, in April. Um, but I was just putting that out there because it's possible now that, that there's a very different corner room in April, then it will most likely be in August Mm -hmm. and September. Um, We're now moving into kind of the more uh, assessment parts, which are really difficult because I'll be honest, neither of us were able to, they started the procession, uh, you know, to into practice earlier than normal. So Jared and I both rolled up pretty early and uh, they were already inside. So we didn't get to see all the players moving in, which we will hopefully see on Saturday, which provides us like, oh, that person's just, very large. That was my Terrence Green assessment from last year. I'm like, oh, that's a big boy, and he carries that weight really well. Um, mm-hmm. Inside practice, I will say I fo- I focus primarily on the quarterbacks, and um, I thought Austin Novosad looks like he's added a little bit of weight, looked a little thicker, which is encouraging. I thought that was something that he really obviously needed to attack coming from his true freshman season where he was a lean kid. Mm-hmm. Um not that it means much of anything, but I did include it in the practice report. When they when they started doing quarterback drills, Novasad went first, followed by Gabriel, followed by Moore, followed by Moga. Um, first day of spring, one guy's returned, the other three guys are all brand new, so it makes sense. But just wanted to communicate the order there, even though I, I am admittedly kind of diminishing its value right away. Um, I, I think it's fair. I think it's pretty fun to watch. The quarterback room, though, right now, because it's three brand new guys. And Nova said, for me, might as well be a brand new guy. I saw him so little last year. It's like kind mm-hmm. of four new guys to watch. So I had a lot of fun watching those those quarterbacks move around. Um, Dylan Gabriel physically, he looks the part. He is the most physically developed of the group. Obviously, he's much shorter than the others. I thought Moga physically actually, again, kind of looked a little bigger than I was anticipating. Dante Moore is 
pretty remarkable physically, not talking about the size, but just the footwork um, and some of the, the the movement skills that I got to watch while they were just kind of going through some on air stuff. But um, fun to watch those guys. Certainly going to be a, a fun competition to watch, I think, primarily for the backup spot. But mm-hmm. those were those are probably the biggest impressions I had because that was where I was watching the most. Um, Jared, what, what stands out from you? Cause there's a couple others I'll note, but I, I don't know what, uh, what, what was popping for you over there on the other field? Uh, other field, obviously special teams. Uh, yeah. we love, love, love special teams. It's still, see, it's still a, uh, Luke Dunn, Ross James battle. Uh, Ross James got the upper hand on Thursday. Uh, he had a, punt that was a hang time of 497 so pretty good uh he was also one of the best punters in the country last year if he sure you know, was if he, uh if he qualified statistically it's just you know Oregon just didn't punt the ball that often unfortunately for him but um nothing crazy on the special teams uh like you know Luke Bosto's back uh I thought the kickoff so Oregon's kickers just practice like squib kicks and like line drive kicks to the tight ends and defensive linemen like they always do. But the the order was interesting. Andrew Boyle, Atticus Sappington, and then Grant Meters um, were the three in a row there. So Boyle could still on the team, much to my surprise. And good news, uh, we just didn't hear we you know we saw him once or twice last year. So. Like literally, like once or twice, I saw him in person last year. So good to know that he's back and he's healthy and he's here and he's kicking. Um, just an interesting order. I don't know what it's going to look like come August or September, but eh, just something to note, I guess. Uh, kick returns were all running backs um, and Nico Reed. So it was Jordan James, Noah Whittington, uh, Nico Reed, Preston Alford, and Jay Harris in order. And then punt returns was Tez Johnson, Gary Bryan Jr., Ryan Pelham, Jack Resler, Dylan Gresham, and Jeremiah McClellan, who got in there like once or twice. McClellan did. He was towards the end of it. Um, just some notable stuff. Uh, you know, Oregon's punt returners last year were, were Tez and Gary Bryan Jr., and then Troy Franklin would jump in every once in a while. So it seems like the wide receivers as the punt returners continues and the running backs as the kick returners continues. Um with the inclusion of Nico Reed, which is interesting because he he did it every once in a while last season, but it was more Rod Pleasant, and mm-hmm. Rod Pleasant wasn't back there today. So maybe that's a sign that they want to just have him focus on defensive backs, or uh, it's just the first practice of the season, and that's all it ever is. On McClellan, and I guess on Moga, pretty ballsy to go with the numbers of – the outgoing superstars at your respective positions, like see McClellan out there in 11. I was like, okay, I'm okay I with like it. That. I like it. I'm okay like, with it. Yeah. He's they're, coming in with some juice. They're normal quarterback and wide receiver numbers. You know, Jericho Johnson is wearing 77 on the D line. Like <laughs> I'm okay with it. You can, you can do whatever you want. We should also note Jer, uh, Jerry on Dickey still in 99. Uh, even though 13, which was the offensive number he apparently coveted last year that Ty Thompson was in, is vacant. So uh, jury on sticking with 99 certainly stands out when you're out there watching. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I have one more. That's not even really a physical impression as much as it is. Jay Harris is, is a big kid. He physically looks the part. I have no idea what yeah. he can do against competition at this level. But when you get a Division II athlete, and certainly having watched his highlight film or whatever you want to call it, it was basically local newsreels um, from back in Missouri. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, he doesn't really have highlight film. He's got like 30 seconds of him scoring short touchdowns, you know, covered by the equivalent of a KZI or or KVAL back in Missouri. Um, But he physically looks fine. And he looks, he looks, he's taller than the the other players, uh, other players being the running backs, taller than Mm -hmm. Jordan James, taller than Noah Whittington, and, and just as broad as both of them. So I would be curious to see what he's listed at once we get to that point of the year, which is probably going to be in August, to be honest. But yeah. early Jay Harris returns are, hey, kid looks certainly like he's physically ready to play at this level. I have no idea what it actually looks like when we get into competition drills. But um, I thought it was encouraging just, hey, this guy looks like he could, he can at least operate at this level. He belongs, I guess. Yeah, he certainly looks the part. Um, that's kind of what I took away too. Again, he was just fielding kicks off of a machine. So there wasn't, Made a couple jump cuts, but he wasn't clearly wasn't going at like a hundred percent. So 
Uh, he, but he clearly looks the part. Uh, no, other guys who looked the part, Sione Laulea and Kingston Lopa. Um, yes. Were both, they're both huge. They're both, they got to be at least six foot four. I think they're listed on like 24 seven as six foot five. But, you know, that's can't always be the most trustworthy. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of inflation there, but they're huge. They're like by far the biggest defensive backs on the team. And I thought that was fun. Uh, 24 was Lopa. Lopa, I think, was a little bit more physically developed than uh, Sione. Um, but different types of physically developed. Like, Sione's a cornerback. He needs to have, like, a different frame on his body than Sione does – or, excuse me, than, um, than Lopa does. So, But I just I just saw both of them. I was like, you guys, you two, I, by far, like, head and shoulders, literally above every other person in the cornerback and DB room. So I thought that was fun. Um Tyshim Johnson is huge. Yeah, I saw that too. That was interesting. Yeah, he's He's, bulked up a lot. He's ginormous now. So uh, I don't know what that necessarily means for his positional future. Like I have him at boundary safety now. And maybe the added weight will help in tackling and going against, you know, stronger running games in the Big Ten in a season. But he's ginormous. He's like... If there was any weight to lose, he has lost it and put on the equal amount of weight in muscle. So that's an interesting one. Um, I don't think that there's any other standout. This guy looks ginormous other than like, you know, Jaquan McRoy, who I saw for a brief (laughs) glimpse. But it's like, wow, no, that guy is huge. Uh, Same with like Jericho Johnson, like the guys who are literally already ginormous. Um, But uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other takeaways i had in that department. i had um i had lopa's name written down as well uh he's super he definitely stands out from a true freshman perspective just big tall like you said but a little bit thicker than i expected I, i'm very intrigued with what he ultimately ends up being because i'm gonna guess he's like six five two ten two fifteen right now and yeah. that's a big old safety the tai Sheem thing i also noticed as well um when you add weight like that, I'm wondering if they wanted to play closer to the box as opposed to playing deep, which would kind of throw our whole safety rotation into a into disarray. So I, I don't know. I thought that yeah. was really interesting as well, Jared. I'm happy you brought that one up. Um, I also saw McRoy out of the side of my eye when we were interviewing Dan and was like, oh, there's the biggest person I've ever seen walking around. And his feet yeah. are also – we're going to have to – we asked Stephen Jones um, when he was here. He was like a close to a size 20 shoe. Jaquan McRoy's feet, big shack. He's got some big old feet too. So that'll be interesting to see if we can uh, track down the size of his, of his footwear there. And then the other one I noticed, and actually it took me a second to remember the numbers because, you know, we got the jerseys just before, but coming off the field, I was like, who's this massive defensive lineman? And it was uh, Jamari Caldwell, who Mm -hmm. very much, another guy. Yeah. He very much looks like a more developed older player, but boy, that's a big kid. So, um, all the guys that are listed or expected to be big, they looked pretty big. Can confirm. <laughs> um, yeah, the other guy I was going to mention was Jamari. Just big dude. Do not want to get in front of him. I think it's pretty simple. Yeah, but breaking news on this podcast. Big guys look like big guys was what we took away from Thursday's yep. practice. And we will um, – Probably could take away. <laughs> pretty That's much. We we'll got. have uh, further opinions on who looks big, who doesn't, hopefully – following Saturday's practice because, again, we're intending to get there like three hours early to make sure Mm -hmm. we don't miss any of Mm -hmm. the procession so we can see all the players come out because uh, 28 newcomers, and I probably only like legitimately saw a dozen of them. So there's a lot of guys I haven't even really laid eyes on, or if I have, I haven't really put together who they are. And then the final part we wanted to do on this show was kind of recap a little bit what we saw earlier this week at Oregon's Pro Day, which was on Tuesday. Fun being out there, fun seeing all of the former Oregon players, 15 of them in total take part, including some pretty darn big names. Bo Nix was there. Troy Franklin was there. Jackson Powers Johnson was there. It was it was kind of cool seeing uh, Bo's throwing at about 25 minutes or so of it was uh, broadcast live on the NFL Network. Um, So, Mm -hmm. you know, you can go. I'm sure some folks here, if you're a diehard Duck fan, you've already seen it, but you can go watch a video of, uh, of most of his throws from the day. But I just wanted to run through some standouts really fast here. Again, most of the guys that did athletic testing in Indianapolis didn't do athletic testing in Eugene. I think the only one who did a little bit was Evan Williams, 
who wanted to improve upon his 40 time and did pretty mm -hmm. minor improvement, but from four, six to four, five, six. But, um, Jared, I'll start with you. Kind of who do you think we have a story we should say up on duckterritory.com that intern uh, John Evans wrote. And I, I think I agree with him. But who are some of your standouts or who do you think kind of improved their stock um, coming out of Tuesday's pro day? Uh, I think the biggest one is obviously Casey Rogers. Um, he was a guy who did not go to the NFL scouting combine um, and was – you know, a guy we've talked about in this podcast who had the potential to be drafted like in the seventh round, like one sure. of the later picks in the draft. But I think he kind of solidified that. I know he's older. I think he said that he was 25. So he's, you know, collecting AARP checks at this point. Um, but he ran a 4'8", 240 at six foot four, 294 pounds. He yeah. had a vertical jump of 35 inches. Um, he had a, a, a pretty good three cone drill uh, or three shot, three cone drill shuttle time. And his broad jump was nine foot eight, which I think would have been the best in the combine. So all like if you put together all of his athletic achievements during the pro day, like they're right at the top of the defensive tackle list for the scouting combine. <clears throat> Him and Braden Fisk or Brendan Fisk of Florida State, who is an absolute freak at the combine. So I think he improved his stock a lot. I, I'm not saying he's going to be like a day two pick and go in the third round or anything like that. But, you know, like if you want to get drafted, like that's the type of performance you need to go get drafted at that age. And that's exactly what he did. So, you know, I, again, I wouldn't be surprised if Tony picks him up in the sixth or seventh round. Um, I think he's a, obviously a very quality individual. And then he's a good football player. Um, you know, he's had some pretty important and pretty impactful plays over his Oregon tenure. And, uh, when you can get a defensive lineman and specifically a D tackle at like 300 ish pounds to move like that teams take a chance. So I'm, I'm happy for him and, and what he was able to do on the pro day. That would have been where I started too. I, I was pretty blown away with just the totality of the athletic mm -hmm. testing. I think we knew he was really athletic. I mean, you go back and watch that, that fake punt that they had earlier this year. And obviously it was like, Oh yeah. Carrying the ball a little bit, but you go, okay, he can move. Like that's not every defensive lineman can, um, explode like he did there. So I, I was expecting him to, to be pretty athletic, but he certainly surpassed expectations that I had with him running 482. You mentioned the vertical jump and the broad jump. Those numbers stood out to me as well. So again, it's hard to know where he'll go if he will even be drafted, but he certainly put enough out there for for scouts and teams to to consider him because athletically, like you said, he he tested better than or just as well as anybody did in Indianapolis earlier this month. Um, I wanted to toss out Jamal Hill's name as another standout. Mm -hmm. Got around a 4 4 1, yeah. which is blazing for, you know, really for anybody. It's the same time that Troy Franklin ran, to be clear. Yeah. Um, and Jamal is 40 pounds heavier at 216 than what Troy was at the uh, NFL combine when he ran 4 4 1. Really physically impressive guy. We've we've known this for a long time. When he ran the forty, and we should note, like we don't have times for a while, like a couple of hours until the times go, that, until the mm -hmm. times are posted. And I think we we're all like that looked really fast, but we didn't know the varying degrees of no how idea. fast it was. Like it was like, is yeah. that four five? Is that sub four five? Who knows? When four four one came out, I was like, wow, that's even maybe faster than I gave him credit for alive. So I think that has to help. I, he is a tweener, you know, six foot two sixteen is what he measured in at. Is that mm -hmm. a linebacker? Is that a safety? Is that a special teams player? It's probably that, yeah. that last part is probably what he'll ultimately end up being. Um, I don't know if he has enough of a solidified position to be drafted, but you can't teach 4-4 speed at 215 pounds when he's built like that and then the rest of the athletic intangibles too. So, I again, I don't know if he gets drafted, but that's certainly somebody that if you're, you know, an NFL personnel or an NFL team, you're going, okay, well, that's some real speed for a, a little bit of a bigger athlete. Let's see if we can mm -hmm. find a spot for him. So um, I thought that was another really good day from another veteran Oregon defender. Yeah, he's, he's a big tweener. I don't know what position he's. He's kind of like the Brandon Dorless at the secondary linebacker spot. Um, yeah, I think Brandon Dorless is a much better player. No disrespect for to Jamal Hill or Scoob or whatever you want to call him, but uh, like he's a big tweener. Uh, if he ran a four four one at the combine, he'd be the fastest linebacker. If he ran a four four one, he'd be the 
tied for the fastest safety, but he'd be bigger than the safety and smaller than the linebacker. So that's it's all weird. you need to know. Like yeah. uh, for the linebacker, it's Peyton Willis. Yeah, Peyton Wilson, excuse me, out of NC State, who ran a four four three, but he's six foot four, two hundred and thirty three pounds. Like that's the difference, and like which is genuinely very impressive for a guy that size to run a four four three. Um, but I think Jamal certainly helped. I think that certainly puts him into like a legitimate conversation somebody has to have in the sixth or seventh round. Like, hey, this guy, we can fix him. You know, it's like any MLB team who sees a guy throw ninety four once. It's like wow. We we can fix him. We can get him to ninety six one day. I I promise. It's going to be the the Jamal Hill discussion with NFL executives and scouts. Like he's six foot. He has a history of playing safety. He's played linebacker last year. He played it pretty well. Mm-hmm. So he has an experience in the secondary, and he has an experience coming up front and hitting guys and showcasing he's physical enough to last there. Like maybe you want to add some weight to him and keep him at linebacker, or maybe you want to drop him back to safety and and drop some weight and move him there. But uh, he's certainly improved his draft stock, like no doubt about it. I'm, I was genuinely floored when I saw it was a four four one. It it's looked fast. It looked fast, yeah. but four four one is is fast, fast, capital F, fast right. for a big kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think, I think like I'll take the other easy fish here and say Bo Nix was like very, very impressive during his pro day. I will uh, cross him off my list because that was the next one I wanted to know. Good one. Yeah, was, uh, I got the two easiest ones here, but I'll take it. Um, I don't have to put together too too much of an argument here. Yeah. Like, you know, no 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 testing, so there's no numbers to be like, wow, he was blank at this and blank at that. But uh, just 20 minutes of throwing and all pretty darn good throws. There was like one or two we were like, eh, not the best, but everything else was on the money, showed some zip. Uh, he threw plenty of deep balls, which I'm sure was by design because the arm strength questions. Yeah. Um, all of the deep balls were either on the money or were actually overthrown, which is okay because they were overthrown by, you know, like a yard. Like these were not like, oh, he overthrew him by 15 feet. Like that, that's a bad throw. It was on the money, uh, like over the outstretched arms of whoever the receiver was. And, you know, if Bo's in the NFL making that throw, that's probably going to get caught because NFL receivers, fun fact, are usually better than college receivers. And they're either faster, longer, run a better route, you know, whatever the case may be, they're probably catching that ball. So that's what I was most encouraged by was the zip on the ball, showcasing the arm strength. And when he missed, he did not miss short. He didn't underthrow guys. He overthrew them. He missed long. He gave the perception that the arm strength was there, which I have always felt that it is there. I've never been really sure why the arm strength question has been one of his biggest downgrades as a prospect. Like, yeah, it's not, he's not Justin Herbert. He's not Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen or Caleb Williams specifically in this draft. But when Bo Nix needs to make a throw down the field, he can do it. He's always been able to step in and drive. My explanation is it's the overreaction to the completion percentage. You see like, oh, he completed 79% of his passes. Oh, that must mean he's only throwing short passes. He can't throw deep. I I genuinely think that plays into it because people are just mystified by he's completing almost 80% of his passes. Yeah, and there's always like, uh, you know, his A dot or his, you know, yards after catch like leads the country or or like is in the the A dot is the lowest in the country. It's like, that's just the offense he plays in. Exactly. There's nothing about like if – you know, like if we had this type of technology at the hands of uh, of everybody on social media during Marcus Mariota's Heisman run, boy, would he get slandered for his A dot because. And, and you know, even before it was that Jared, he was getting hit. That was the big t- that was the big knock on Marcus too. Yeah, yeah, he just like they just didn't move the ball down the field. Like, no, they did. They just didn't do it in the ways that uh, you you expect it to be. Like they weren't. Um, they weren't USC who was going to take shots like down the field vertical a lot, even though Oregon really did. Kinda, and Bo Nix, did. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Like look at what Troy Franklin did. His average yards per reception was 17 yards. Like it's pretty good. Um, but again, at the con or excuse me, at the pro day, he was good. He was stepping in the balls. Uh, he was hitting targets. Uh, I thought he showcased the versatility of who he could hit with Tez and Troy and Terrence Ferguson, Trey Sean and Bucky. Like, 
he was good. He was really, really, really good. He was much better than I thought he would be. And that's not a dig. I just I thought he was going to be good and I thought he was very, very good this time around. So I was I was pretty impressed. Definitely didn't hurt his stock. I think he probably just solidified that what you've seen in Indianapolis and what you saw on the field this past season is what you're getting. I think he probably mm-hmm. made Jared rethink 40 throws in that 20 minute period, something like that. So yeah. Roughly. It was a lot. Um, yeah. It was a lot of throws, 40, maybe 50. Um, like you said, I think he had the one overthrow to, I believe it was Tezra Gary. Um, it was kind of like on a post route across the field um, or a corner yeah. route. Uh, had a couple that were a little high, but pretty much everything was was catchable and, and was, was on the money. So, yeah, I thought he had a really good day. And then the last one I'm going to bring up is one that uh, just surprised me. I don't think it really matters too much because this player's not getting drafted. And, and frankly, I don't know if they'll really get much of an NFL shot. But Camden Lewis made like every kick he attempted, including a 60-yard field goal, which considering his <laughs> career high at Oregon was, I think, like, what, 40? Um, 40. Like 45, he, maybe. I think he might have hit one that was closer. Yeah, he might have hit you right. I think in 2022, he might have hit a couple that were a little longer. But we did not see 60 yard field goal range or anything near that from Camden Lewis. And we have to note it was inside with absolutely no elements. There's no wind. So perfect kicking conditions. But Camden went out there and I thought he missed one. We heard from somebody else that they kind of pushed back and said maybe he made all of his kicks. Regardless, he had an, a, a very solid, solid day. Again, I don't anticipate he's probably going to get picked up by anybody. I could be totally wrong. Maybe he'll get a, a training camp invite for a team mm-hmm. that is, you know, looking for a kicker and wants to kind of spread a wide net. I think the consistency issues at Oregon would probably sta- stand out. But on this particular day in front of 60 plus NFL personnel and a bunch of, you know, media and fans and I should say f- you know, friends and family, mm-hmm. he, he was dialed in and he, Put them all through. So I, I thought Camden had a nice day. I just wanted to shout him out because uh, I didn't know how that was going to go, to be totally honest, considering how the year went. But he, he was pretty darn consistent out there, and I'm sure um, at least left the scouts going, okay, well, this guy in a, in a, in a perfect weather condition is uh, is pretty darn accurate. Yep. It kind of goes to the you know the MLB perspective again. Like, we, we can fix him. Like, he could do this then. We can make him – you know, do it whenever we'd like. Uh, yeah, I, I thought for, for everybody else, I thought Evan Williams was good. I thought Steve Stevens was good. I thought they both put up some pretty good times. Um, I think Evan is more likely to be picked. Um, Steven Definitely. Jones, we talked about this, is kind of like, I don't know, he's huge. He can kind of move well. Like, sure, like, you might as well give him like a UDFA or a roster spot and just see what he can do. Kind of the Kind of the TJ Bass of this year's class. So um, I thought that he probably helped his draft stock. Um, I thought Taki was fine. Uh, I don't remember what uh, Popo did off the top of my head, but he he looked athletic. He looked like he was really moving out there. Uh, I want to get his 40 time because if I remember correctly, it was pretty good. Uh, he ran uh, 518. And a guy who's... Six three two three hundred, like that's not terrible. And no. for his traits, uh, you know, his problem again is age and his injury history. But his traits maybe would get a UDFA. Uh, I don't think he would go like seventh round. But I think that someone will be like, you know what? Like when he was healthy, he was really good, and maybe we're willing to give him a shot on this. But um, yeah, I thought everybody else was was fine. I thought there were really like like a couple of standout guys among those who who tested. Obviously, other guys went to you know Indianapolis and tested, but uh, of the pro day, I think you know we I think we've covered everybody who's who had a good day. I think you feel good about as we said before, six players invited, or sorry, seven players were invited to Indianapolis. Correct? Yeah, seven. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you feel good about all seven of those players being drafted. I, do you think Evan Williams has done enough to be like, I think he'll be selected? He might not be, but the other five or the other six, I should say, are all undoubtedly going and probably primarily in the first two days. Um, and then a player like Casey, maybe a player like Jamal, I don't know, a Stephen Jones, a Popo, those are kind of the names that have done enough, I think, to at least be under consideration where I wouldn't be totally floored 
if they were selected in next month's draft. But again, mm-hmm. we're looking at seventh round. I think projecting who's going to go in the seventh is kind of challenging, right? Because there's just a team needs what it comes down to. And it, yeah, know, it, I, might be, it could be a spot where a team's like, hey, I, I don't necessarily think this player is a, a seventh round talent, but we really wanted to address defensive line. So we're going to take them. So that's yeah. where it gets tough at the end there. Yeah, yeah. Like seventh round, I that's just a guessing game. That like sometimes it's like, oh, this is my like my uh the the, the general manager's great grandson. Like, hey, we're gonna take him in the seventh round. It's like you have no idea what's gonna happen. Um kind of like last year where Jordan Riley and um maybe Forsyth, Forsyth I think was in the seventh round. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember if he was sixth or seventh, but yeah, yeah. You're just like, oh, well, Oregon's guys are done for the day, and then nope, two in the seventh. So could be very, very similar to that this year, just with the guys that are there, um, Steve, like specifically Stephen Jones, Taki Taimani, and Casey Rogers and Popo. Like Those are guys who maybe someone wants to take a flyer on them. Um, older guys, but some athletic traits and a lot of film. A lot of film you can go watch and be like yes or no on these guys. All right. Unless you had anything else pro day or practice related, I think we're ready to wrap this pod up. Um, a lot of things that were kind of fun to talk about. We saw some football stuff, which is the first time we'd really done any of that for multiple months. Like, I don't know. I was yeah. just fired up that we were out there. January, um, amongst, yeah. yeah. Amongst our, our, our journalist brethren watching some stuff that probably doesn't mean a ton, but that was at least kind of fun to be out there again. Mm-hmm. Um, we will be back at practice on Saturday morning. We'll have full coverage from that. Um, I'm sure we'll have a podcast at some point next week where we will touch on if we learned anything new from Saturday session. And again, then they are on a few week break before they reconvene on April 2nd for the, the, the first of 13 April practices, which culminates with the spring game on April 27th. We will have full coverage at DuckTerritory.com and I should have noted this before. We are running a 50% off VIP subscription promotion right now. So if you are a fan of the podcast or a fan of our work and you want to see what it looks like to get all of our coverage from a VIP perspective, now would be a good time to take advantage of that. But for Jared Mack, this has been Eric Scopel signing off from the Otson Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks.